This morning we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Um, if your Bibles are still open, then um, that's, that's good. If not, if you'd like to open it, I have just one verse to read. And then we'll move on from, from there to examine that uh, particular truth. Again, Paul writes to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 1.18. And remember that the messages, the letters written to these churches, the gospels and so forth written to believers back then are equally for us. And they certainly apply to us, and as I've already mentioned, this particular passage certainly applies to our world today. For the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. How you perceive the gospel, how you view it, will be a good indication of where you are at with regard to heaven and hell, with regard to salvation or being lost. If it appears foolish to you, you are perishing. But if it is wisdom to you, if it is the truth to you, then you are saved by the power of God. At least you are if you're trusting what you believe to be true. Now, I think, um, I think you understand enough about this world to understand that most people today do not believe that the Bible is true. Uh, that most people in this modern age of science would think you're a fool to believe something like this. Uh, you know, this has been going on for quite some time. Karl Marx, for instance, you know, the one who is uh, infamous for having uh, written a book uh, called The uh, Communist Manifesto, from which we get, of course, communism. Uh, he didn't believe that it was true. He believed that it was nothing more than a story that was made up by uh, the masters or those people who possess the tools, you know, the capitalists, uh, in order to oppress and enslave those that would work for them. It was like a drug. Uh, he called it the opiate of the masses. Uh, just tell them that there's this uh, heaven that follows this struggle on earth, so they have something to look forward to, and then they'll work for you uh, happily. So he saw its usefulness just to deceive people. And of course, many other people look at the Bible and the gospel as nothing other than an old story that perhaps a group of people made up because they wanted to make sense out of the things that they see in life. They think it's basically a myth like uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey. And still other people believe that it, you know, it's not true, but it has some use. Uh, it's useful to teach our children. You know, many people take their kids and put them into Sunday school classes because they know that if they uh, get these Bible stories, it will teach them some good morals. And parents believe that their children ought to have some good morals. They apparently don't believe they need them, so they stay home. But they just send their kids off to the Sunday school for these lessons. Now, you also know, again, this isn't anything new. Because even in Paul's day, uh, the Gentiles... And, and the Jews alike thought it was foolishness. Uh, the Jews, they believed the Old Testament, but they did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. They did not believe he was the Savior of the world. And the Greeks, as I've already mentioned, who prided themselves on their wisdom and their pursuit of knowledge, thought it was foolishness. Now, if truth were determined by a headcount then certainly they would be right. But don't forget, you cannot determine truth by the number of people who believe it. That's a very well-known logical fallacy, argument uh, from popularity of a particular idea. The majority can be wrong and often is wrong. The truth has to stand or fall on its own. It doesn't matter how many people believe it or don't believe it. Now, why is it that so many people today reject the Bible? Well, usually it's because they think they have a better explanation for everything that they see around them. Uh, today, that better explanation is evolution. And I should mention at the outset, there's really only two contenders for what we see and as explanations for everything that is around us, two competing worldviews, evolution and creation. Now, I think you know there's perhaps another 
uh, another idea that's sort of intruded into the presence because of the lack of evidence in evolution. And that's the idea of uh, alien involvement. Uh, lots of science fiction movies have been made about that. There's one real popular today. If you, I wouldn't recommend that you see it because of its, its content, not that I've seen it, but it's called Prometheus. And in this uh, story, it's basically they discover that life on this planet was engineered by these alien engineers on another planet. And by the time they find them, they find these engineers want to destroy all the life that's on this planet because they don't like what's happened. But you realize, of course, if you have alien involvement, all you're doing is pushing evolution to another time and to another place because then you have to explain where the aliens came from, right? So there's really only two views to explain what we see, and that is that it either evolved accidentally or it was created. Now, before the advent of modern science, most people looked to religion to explain how these things came about. But I think you understand, since the age of enlightenment, where modern science basically began, although it's, um, it, some might argue it went further back, the fires of hell were put out in the minds of most people. Since that time, most people turn to science. And science has basically given to us a new understanding of reality, which isn't really new. This new wisdom. Basically, people believe that science has the answers. They deal with facts. And so they look to the scientists for their explanation of reality. And since so many scientists appear to believe in evolution, well, they must be right. And so they just accept what the so-called experts say, not really understanding that many evolutionary scientists today have already rejected the idea of evolution because there's really no evidence for it. And when I say no evidence, I'm not saying that there isn't you know, some fossil or fossils that evolutionists look at and say this is a clear indication of progress in a species from one to another, but there isn't the kind of evidence that you ha would have to see if evolution were true, and so many scientists have rejected it. Well, let's consider this morning these two competing worldviews to see which is reasonable and which is foolish. And we'll consider first the wisdom of the world, that is evolution, and that briefly. And then secondly, the wisdom of God in the Bible and in the gospel. So first of all, let's consider the world's wisdom. And what I'm going to do here is simply reduce evolutionary thought to its basic ideas. Evolutionists believe that everything that we see in this world, from the bricks and the walls to the ants crawling on the ground to you and me who are standing here uh, thinking together, they believe that all these things were caused by one grand accident, interestingly, after another, from the, the cause of the universe down to the cause of life. All of it was accidental. All of it was purely by time and by chance. They believe, given enough time, anything can happen. Now, they believe, of course, that all the stuff in the universe, all the matter, all the dirt clods, all the rocks that are floating through space have always been there. They believe that matter is eternal. They believe that all this stuff that's out there basically organized itself into a universe. By the way, when you study the universe, and you think about the idea of a Big Bang, which is what you know, evolutionists believe in. This dirt clod in space basically exploded and created everything that you see. Okay. If that were true, if that had actually happened, then you would see chunks of rock floating through space just randomly, but perhaps uniformly. You would not see organization. You would not see galaxies. You would not see solar systems. But you would see chunks of rock floating around in space, and that's all you would see. So. What they're saying is that all the organization, when we talk about a universe, we're talking about an organized system out there that is organized, that that came about purely by accident, an explosion in space. And again, purely by chance. On this particular rock, some of these things combined accidentally to form life, the first living cell. And from that, somehow that living cell survived 
to grow into all the wonderful varieties of creatures that we see in this world today, from the plants with their vivid colors. If you've been out uh, during the springtime, you see all the different colors and uh, just the beauty of all that, all the different scents, all the different smells and so forth, from all the plants to all the animals, from the smallest mouse to the largest whale to man. All of this happened purely by accident, completely by chance, by, from basically a rock that exploded in space a long time ago. Now, what's the problem with that kind of thinking? Why would we reject that idea? Well, I, I think if you remember from last time, there is a principle that is called cause and effect. If you're going to explain how something happened, you do have to have an explanation that is believable, one that is reasonable, one that can account for what you see. And one thing that cause and effect tells us is that you cannot have something greater coming from something that is less. Let me give you an example. If you happen to be hiking out in the, in the mountains and you, you know, let's say you're, you're out in um, another country, places where there's caves, you're out in the desert, and suddenly you, you find a cave and you walk into that cave and you see a, a rock in the middle of the cave. And on, and on top of that rock is a laptop, a laptop computer, and it happens to be turned on. It's got Windows, uh, well, what is it, Windows 7 or whatever the new version is on it. <laughs> Would you assume, when you looked at that, that that laptop had basically grown out of that rock? Would you look at the rock as the cause of that laptop computer? Now, I would tend to think that you wouldn't think that because the rock really could not explain the laptop. The laptop is greater than the rock, right? It shows signs of design. It shows signs of intelligence. And the rock doesn't have either of those things. Now, what if you were walking by the cave and you went inside and there was a baby on top of the rock? Would you believe that the baby came from that rock? Would you believe the rock was the cause of that? I don't think you would think that either, especially because a baby is, I don't know how many times more complicated than a laptop. And yet, isn't that exactly what evolution teaches? If you have enough time, that rock is going to give birth to a child. That is how they think we came into being. So the question is this, does evolution really explain what it is you see? Does evolution explain the stuff in the universe that has been organized into planets and solar systems and galaxies? Does evolution explain all the life that we see and the variety of life on this planet? And by the way, the fact that we don't find life on any other planet than this. I, I don't know if you know this, but when they, when, earlier on in, in the, the space race, when they were sending people up into space, they thought there was going to be biological activity out there. And so every time an astronaut would go into space and circle the Earth and then come back down, they'd put them in isolation for a long period of time to see if they were going to get sick and die from some sort of plague that might have come from outer space. But after a while, they began to understand there was no life out there. And so no reason to isolate the astronauts, so they stopped doing that. Because life exists only on this planet. How could evolution explain that? Why only here? Why not somewhere else? All those science fiction movies that we see, you know, and uh, over the years, those all believe uh, are based on the, pro the uh, principle of evolution. If it happened here, it happened somewhere else as well. Does evolution explain or help us to understand the volumes of information that we saw are encoded on every single DNA molecule that is in every cell of your body and every cell of every living creature that contains, again, volumes and volumes of information. Chance and time, does that explain it? Can, can it account for the fact that, again, your, your cells can use that information, lifeless molecules can read it and actually build things and put them into use in living creatures? Can evolution explain how that happened? Can a rock and unlimited time explain intelligence? Can it explain purpose, the fact that we are purposeful beings? Can it explain morality? 
Now, if you think that evolution can explain these things, you have far more faith than most scientists have today who are finally beginning to admit that evolution does not explain anything, that evolution is, in fact, impossible. So there's, again, choice number one. We only have these two competing views. There is no third option, evolution and creation. Which one is foolish? Which one is wise? Well, what does the Bible teach? Does it do a better job of explaining reality, of explaining the things that we see? Now, the Bible gives to us, it tells us, of a cause which is much greater than what you see, which is, of course, what you need because of the law of cause and effect. An infinite being that the Bible calls God, who has unlimited power and knowledge and the ability to do these things. He can also explain how the stuff that is in the universe, the rocks, got there in the first place. He created them. Who, he explains how all these things could be organized into a system of planets and stars and galaxies because he has the power to do this and he has the wisdom to do this. He explains where all the kinds of life could come from in this world because he has the ability also to organize matter into life. And the Bible explains as well why that life exists only on this planet. It explains why the rest of the universe was created. I don't know if you know who Carl Sagan is, uh, somebody who has already lived and died and who knows better now than what he was teaching while he was alive, uh, an astronomer, somebody who was a cosmologist, somebody who was kind of a popular figure who stood as the figurehead, as it were, of evolution. He used to say this, if there is life only on this planet, then this universe is an incredible waste of space. Now, what he was saying was, if, if there really was a God, why would he create life only on this planet? What's the purpose of all the rest of this? It's just a huge waste. Well, it isn't a waste if you understand why it is God made what he made. He didn't make the universe to be a home for more life. He made the universe to display his wisdom and his power. And that's exactly what it does. So it's not a waste of space at all. But the Bible explains why the universe exists and why there is only life on this planet. It also explains where all the information came from that is encoded on your uh, strands of your DNA molecules that are in your body. It came from God, who also put the mechanism there to read and use that information. And finally, the Bible also explains to you why you, distinct from all the other creatures that God has made, is distinct from the flowers, distinct from the animals, and so forth, why it is you are intelligent, why it is you have purpose in life, why it is you are moral, the reason is because God made you in his image. Again, the Bible explains and gives us a, a reasonable explanation, the only possible explanation. Now again, some people might say, well, that doesn't really explain anything because it's impossible to believe that such a being could exist. But the thing is, creation proves it. If you're going to have organization on a cosmic level, you know, a universe full of, of, of I think, billions of galaxies that are huge and they're all organized, you have to have something to account for that organization. And really, the only thing that can is God. If you have intelligence, if you have purpose, if you have morality, you have to account for those qualities. Whatever caused it must possess it. And so as you deduce what the cause of all these things must be, what you come up with is an infinite, eternal, and unchangeable being who has intelligence, who has purpose, who is moral. And especially when you consider the conscience that he has given to each one of us that tells us when we do right and when we do wrong. This shows us that this God, this being, knows uh, the difference between right and wrong and has given us this faculty so that we would know it as well. So the Bible explains these things, gives to us the only reasonable explanation for what it is that we see. But I want you to know as well that the Bible goes beyond this and explains also why 
we have the problems that we have in this world. People who are evolutionists just believe that the necessary consequence of this cosmic accident is that there must be hunger, there must be sickness, there must be lying and theft and murder. But why? Why would, why would that be the case? Why would evolution produce all of these negative things? Why is the history of our world not a pretty one? As you read about all the wars, all the deaths that have taken place in, on this planet. Well, the Bible explains to us why these things have happened. It's because God made man, but man rebelled against God, who is very gracious in making us in the first place and providing for us. And in rebelling against him has come under his wrath. But the Bible also explains what God has done to overcome this, to reconcile you back to himself. It says that he sent his son into the world, Jesus Christ, to do what you failed to do, and that is obey him, and to make a payment for the sins of mankind if they would only receive it on the cross. And really, when you stop and think about it, again, it's the only reasonable way that God could have reconciled us to himself. He can't simply overlook what we've done because then he would not be just, but the Bible says that he is perfect and he is holy and he loves what is right and what is good. You can't just simply dismiss a wrong that has been done on this scale or any wrong and simply overlook it. God could not do that. So what he had to do is he had to create a perfect man, which is what he did, but that man had also to be God, and he was. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, perfect man and perfect God, who came and made the payment necessary, did what was necessary to reconcile us. We sinned, and so he became one with us in order to make a payment on our behalf so that if we would only trust him, he would forgive our sins, and he would give to us the righteousness or the obedience that we need in order to enter into heaven. The Bible goes even further than that to say that he will not only forgive you, but he will give you what he intended to give man in the first place before he rebelled, and that is eternal life and an eternal home with him forever in the new heavens and the new earth. So basically what you have set before you are these two possibilities, and really the only two possibilities, evolution and creation. Either the idea that everything came about purely by accident, by time and chance, either here or somewhere else first, as evolutionists believe, or that it was created through the power and wisdom of a limitless being called God, as the Bible teaches. Now, you have to make a decision this morning which you believe to be true and which you believe to be foolish. Which one are you going to choose? Now, I do need to remind you that there are consequences for your choice. If evolution is true, or the idea of you know, evolutionism and so forth, if that's true, that when you die, you will simply cease to exist, just like you were never here. No ideas, no remembrance, no consciousness, but just simply pure nothingness. That's where you came from, and that's where you will go. But if the Bible is true, then you will continue to exist even after you die. Now, if you believe what the Bible says is true, and you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to save you from your sins, from your guilt, he will take you to heaven where you will be perfectly happy for the rest of eternity. But if you don't, believe the Bible. If you don't trust Jesus to save you. If you continue to believe that all these things happened purely by chance. If you don't turn from your sins, the Bible says that you, when you die, will be punished for those sins forever in hell. Again, the Bible says that God is just. He must punish every single wrong thing that you've done against him and against your neighbor. Jesus says, but I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in 
the day of judgment. So if you believe evolution, even though evolutionists believe when you die, you're going to go out of existence, the Bible says no one goes out of existence. The Bible says you're going to be in one of two places, heaven or hell. If you believe as evolutionists believe, you will be in hell. But if you believe the Bible is true and trust in Jesus, then you will be safe. You will be happy. God will accept his death on the cross as payment for your sins. Either you have to pay for those sins or he has paid for them if you trust in him. And what you choose, of course, is going to make the difference between being happy forever or being miserable forever. Now, if you're wise, you will choose what is true. And I just want to bring in, in this last point, uh, some of the things that to, I hope, further uh, convince you that this is true. You realize you're not the first person who's ever had to wrestle with that question of whether this is wisdom or whether this is foolishness. Many people throughout history have wrestled with it. Many people who didn't have all the powerful evidence that we have today. I mean, the more people learn, the more scientists learn about the creation, some people say, oh, that's more evidence for evolution. But really, is it? The more we learn about how the cell works, the more we learn about the DNA molecule and all of its information, the more we learn about the fact that this context exists, that where this information actually is understood and a mechanism to actually use it and to build living creatures, does that prove evolution or does that refute it? Well, those are things we have, but the people who have lived before us didn't have that, and yet still many believed, still many accepted what, what, they, uh, what they heard, what, and some, of course, what they saw. What were they looking at to prove to them? Well, they were looking at uh, the things they would look at uh, that you would, if you were, for instance, in a court of law trying to determine whether something was true or not, you would go to the eyewitnesses. The Bible gives us many eyewitness accounts that these things actually happened, that Jesus Christ actually came into the world, born of a virgin. They heard what he had to say. They saw the miracles that he performed. They realized that he was fulfilling prophecies that were made hundreds of years before he even came into the world. And they also saw him alive after he had been crucified, after he died on the cross. They saw him living after that. There were over 500 people who saw Jesus Christ alive after his resurrection. And these people were all of them willing to lay down their lives for what they saw. Now, many of them actually did do that. And you have to ask yourself the question, if the people who actually saw Jesus Christ, heard what he said and saw what he did, if, if they did not, if, if they knew that what he did wasn't true, would they be willing to lay down their lives for that? I don't think people lay down or are willing to die for things they know is some kind of a deception to seal their blood just so that people might be duped in the future. I mean, people die for what they believe. And these people saw, and they believed, and they laid down their lives. And you know what? It wasn't just them. But millions of people have done this since the time of our Lord Jesus Christ. Millions throughout history were willing to do the same because they believed what God said. You know, there's, even, there's evidence that's even more convincing than the ones that I've given you already. And it's basically the evidence that God gives of the truth of his word in his word itself and by the power of his Holy Spirit. Through the power of the gospel to change lives, God can do that and he can convince you beyond a shadow of a doubt. Now the evidence is all here. Organization and design on a cosmic scale, the information in the DNA molecule, the mechanism to put it to use, your intelligence, your consciousness, your self-awareness, morality, things we see in this world, beauty, harmony, and symmetry, the eyewitness accounts of those who saw him, who saw his miracles, who saw prophecies fulfilled, and saw him rise again from the dead, the many who have and who are still willing to die for this truth. Is the Bible, is the gospel foolishness? Well, Paul says if that's how you see it this morning, then you will perish. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. 
If that's the way you see it, you will bear the guilt of every single one of your sins and be condemned by them, be condemned by Jesus Christ on Judgment Day. But if you believe it, and if you receive Jesus, he will give to you eternal life. Paul says, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The gospel is the power of God to everyone who believes. And so don't foolishly accept what the scientists are saying. It's obvious what they're saying is not true in this regard. They have come to this conclusion purely because they refuse to accept the only viable alternative, which is that God exists and they're accountable to him. Do not be foolish as they are foolish. Even many of them are rejecting those ideas. Don't reject God's truth, but believe the evidence. Receive the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Lord says, you will be saved. Well, I hope by God's grace that you will do that and that each one of us will here this morning. Let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's come to the Lord in our hearts and pray before him that he would give us the grace to trust in him and also to take perhaps some of the things we've seen to other people to try and convince them also of the truth.